webinar has been organized by the Access and Delivery Partnership in collaboration with UNDP, the Countdown Initiative, Liverpool School of Tropical Medicine, and TDR, and it is sponsored by the government of Japan. So the webinar, as Tim mentioned, will be recorded and will be available at the ADP website at adphealth.org. So now I'm very excited that today is the first World NTD Day. As you know, NTDs affect some of the world's poorest people and the communities. Because the NTDs impact the vulnerable and those left behind, progress against NTDs also affects other sustainable development goals, such as poverty, education, water and sanitation, reducing inequality, climate change, and many more. However, the gender dimensions of NTDs have been under-examined. So we have conducted the research to better understand how sex and gender intersect with the other key social determinants of health, such as poverty, education, and the livelihoods. We published our research findings in a discussion paper on the gender dimension of NTDs, including the five practical recommendations for action that the countries and partners can take. Today, our three speakers will highlight why it is important to understand the gender dimensions of NTDs. They will also provide some country case studies from Asia and Africa. So now, let me begin by welcoming the first panelist, Sally Pelfall from the Liverpool School of Tropical Medicine. Over to you, Sally. Thank you very much, Nami, and hello and welcome to everyone from Liverpool. I'm here in a room with colleagues from Countdown, including colleagues who played a role in writing that discussion paper. So please, can we share my slides? And can we go to the first slide, please? So why should we be focusing on gender and neglected tropical diseases and why now? Next slide, please. So gender relations and gender norms are social, cultural, changeable. What it means and the expectations to be a man, to be a woman, to be a person of any gender, those power relations and expectations linked to norms, beliefs, roles, accesses to resources and decision making. And what's important to note is that how we experience our gender operates on various levels simultaneously in terms of our individual identities and values, the interpersonal relationships that we have within households, the relationships that we have with community-based drug distributors, whether they're a man, whether they're a woman, and the trust that we have with them. Gender also shapes institutions, structures, and resources, including NTD programs and how they operate. Please keep going with the slide. And we're seeing an increasing focus on intersectionality. And I know Olamide is going to talk about this later. The interplay of gender with other axes of inequity, be it poverty, disability, sexuality, and how they think together. And this comes also from black feminist thought from the US, and a quote here from Audre Lorde. There is no such thing as a single issue struggle because we do not live single issue lives. Next slide, please. So why now? We know that gender norms, roles and relationships shape vulnerability to NPDs within rapidly changing context. We know that social economic consequences of NTD, the stigma, discrimination, and social isolation, how that plays out is affected by gender. And we have an increasing evidence base on this, and we'll talk more about that in the discussion paper. We also have implementation gaps. 
So I want you to think about a girl child in a context that you know well. Is she less likely to go to school than her brothers? If so, she's less likely to have access to NTD treatment. She's probably more likely to be pulled out of school to care for a family member who may have an NTD. If she has an NTD herself, she will experience stigma. And in this way, we can see how NTDs and gender interplay across the life cycle. Children's lives are at stake here. And if we can get NTD programs working and taking a gender equity lens in their work, they will be a key player in gender justice and will also be able to impact positively on multiple SDGs, education, poverty, water, because NTDs are so cross-sectoral, there's real opportunities for change. Gender inequality and inequity in relation to NTDs is socially governed. They can change and they are therefore actionable. Next slide, please. Previous slide, please. So, first NTD day today. Beat NTD for good for all. And if we're going to meet that rallying call, we need to think about gender and sex and that intersection with other social determinants. We need to develop strategies for change. We need collaboration. And we have a growing evidence base here. I'm going to talk you through our discussion paper now. And we hope to inspire you to take action so that NTD programs can be a key player in gender justice. Next slide, please. So here is the discussion paper. So funded through the people of Japan and through the Access and Delivery Partnership. It is open access, it is there, the links are there, and it's divided into two sections. So the first section synthesizes the evidence, what we know about the impacts of sex and gender on NTD risk and outcomes, and this intersection with other axes of inequity. The second section has recommendations for addressing NTD-related gender inequities. There's five key recommendations that all of us can play a role in meeting. The recommendations are synthesized also in a short fact sheet. So get that fact sheet up, please have a look at it. See where you can play a part here. Next slide, please. I want to take you now to Ogun State in Nigeria. These photos were taken two weeks ago and they show how Men, women, boys and girls interact with water in gendered ways. Men more likely to be fishing, women accessing water for daily chores, collecting water. In this Fulani community, this water source is the only opportunity to access water. This water source is infected with schistosomiasis. Next slide, please. Uh, the next slide talks about and gives an illustration of urogenital schistosomiasis, female genital schistosomiasis, male genital schistosomiasis. And the orange is the sex-related differences. The green is the gender, social, and environmental determinants. So very briefly then, an example of sex and interactions with FGS is that women who have female genital schistosomiasis are more likely to have lesions in their vagina, which provides a risk factor for STIs such as HIV. Men will have higher HIV viral loads. And look at the multiple ways in which gender shakes out and interacts to shape vulnerability. So including interaction with different water sources in gendered ways, as we've seen in those photos I've just showed you. Next slide, please. So the next slide highlights the different recommendations from the report. And in brief, they are about understanding gender divisions of labor, how they play out. They're about how gender impacts the accessibility and acceptability of treatment. Next slide, please. 
They are about addressing stigma and mental health. They are about collecting and using gender sensitive and sex disaggregated data within implementation research, within programs, and to not add, over aggregate that data so that we can, in programs, amongst communities, respond to inequities. And the last one is about taking a health systems approach that promotes intersectoral processes so that different communities and programs come together to address gender inequities and how they play out. Next slide, please. And this is my last slide. And I just want to show you that there is a growing body of work on gender and NTDs alongside this discussion paper. So there's been a, a recent set of papers published in PLOS NTDs on gender. So have a look at those. Here's some other resources. WHO also have guidance for assessing who is being left behind and why. The resources are growing and we need further action. So please engage on Twitter, share your experiences. Let's start the debate and have some more action now. Thank you. All right. Uh, thank you, Sally. Uh, we now turn to Dr. Chandani Carl. Uh, thank you, Chandani. Yeah. Hi, Mammy. Thank you. Um, can I have the slides, please? Hello, everyone. Um, with regards to gender and activities, I'll be talking about uh, disease control programs, my perspective from what I've seen in Nepal. And um, uh, as Mami said, I work in Herd International, which is a research organization in Nepal. And uh, I'm very pleased to be uh, part of this webinar. So can I have the next slide? So we'll mostly be talking about intersectional gender analysis. And uh, what I wanted to show you in this slide was, uh, is an upcoming uh, toolkit, uh, which is being developed by TDRWHO on intersectional gender analysis for research on infectious diseases of poverty, which we uh, launched uh, shortly in 2020. And uh, not only intersectional gender analysis is important in everyday uh, research in health systems research, but it's more important in infectious diseases of poverty because it enables us to understand ecology, prevention, control, and management of infectious diseases, as well as it helps you understand how exposure to disease, vulnerability to disease, and response to treatment, health related decision making, etc., are also interlinked, and in how you can do research. Uh, to better understand infectious diseases poverty, both from a, a, a service provider perspective, as well as uh, both from a supply side perspective, as well as demand side perspective. Next slide, please. So, while talking about uh, the intersectionality, the gender analysis in Nepal, I just wanted to focus as a case study on the dengue outbreak which happened in Nepal in 2019. And this was something unusual because you do have dengue outbreaks in the uh, low flatlands of Nepal, which is called the Tarai areas, but you normally don't see it in Kathmandu, which, is, which has a higher altitude and where uh, mosquitoes uh, breeding is not very commonly found. So it was quite unusual for uh, Nepal, especially Kathmandu, to see a dengue outbreak. And this happened in uh, from June, uh, as reported by uh, different uh, newspapers, as well as as reported by uh, different um, um, or institutions. There were various, um, there were around uh, 11,000 case reports happened at that time. And you can see that there was quite some confusion as reported in the newspapers, whether it should be considered as health emergency or not. And finally, it was decided by the Ministry of Health that it was not an emergency. But however, uh, can I go to the next slide? 
Um, so I want to focus here on how we can do a gender intersectional analysis looking at uh, disease control programs where everyone is familiar with this building six building blocks framework of the WHO. And I have tried to uh, see how um, we can do analysis in uh, health systems domains and linking it up with the infectious disease domains, as the fo um, especially looking at etiology, prevention, control, and management of these diseases. And I'll be talking about each health system domain in the following slides. Can we go to the next one? So when you see from the health system response point of view, in terms of governance, it is usually the epidemiology and disease control division within the Department of Health Services, which comes under the Ministry of Health, that is responsible for the governance of, uh, for, of formulating policies and seeing that policies are being implemented in disease control programs. And the EDCD uh, has a separate section, which se separate unit, which looks at the prevention, uh, the dengue control program within Nepal. So the policy does exist, and there is active implementation arrangements put in place. Uh, like for example, there are 118 sentinel sites uh, for surveillance reporting mechanism. So those uh, aspects do function currently. But however, when you look at it from an gender and intersectionality lens, you see that there's lack of integration within policies as well as within reporting mechanisms. For example, the red uh, guideline that you see is a newly launched guideline in 2019. This was launched in September 2019, which was after, uh, in the midst of the dengue outbreak. And out here, you in, within this guideline, you do have, uh, it talks about specific uh, inclusions for uh, treatment management for elderly people as well as for pregnancy group of people, but it really does not focus on equitable treatment as showing how you do not, how you encompass everyone within the health system, where you do not want to leave out vulnerable people, where you ensure that you, you as government is not really leaving anyone behind. And when you look at the second, uh, the second um, document that I put up here was the reporting document that was uh, the early warning and reporting document that was published weekly as part of the surveillance system. But however, in this document reporting sheet also, it usually talks about case uh, mechanisms. It uh, reports number of cases, but really does not give data on sex or uh, any disaggregated data related to gender or vulnerable population. And especially in Nepal, uh, when you talk of intersectionality, the caste and ethnicity is a major factor which comes into playing uh, how health is, uh, how health systems uh, and how, how health is perceived by people. So that component is entirely missing in this uh, reporting mechanism. Can we go to the next slide? The next slide is about uh, service delivery mechanism. How did the health system respond during uh, the dengue outbreak? And when you look at, you can divide the service delivery comp uh, component into two parts. Uh, in the prevention and control measures, there were, you could see streets being um, fogged with pesticides and you could see that uh, uh, preventive measures were taking place uh, in the streets and especially which which was an unusual site in Kathmandu. But no report ever showed evidence of really reaching out to poor and vulnerable population. When I say vulnerable population, yeah, I my focus is more on men and women, both working outdoors, especially uh, surrounding Kathmandu, you have lots of fields areas. So people working outdoors as well as school population, because you do know that in uh, dengue, the, you are more vulnerable during uh, daytime where mosquito biting is more that time. So there was no really evidence of how this worked. And when you looked at uh, curative services, you found there was only limited information of sex disaggregated treatment outcomes. There were only few sporadic reporting 
of how disease impacted on the people and how they sought in terms of their treatment seeking behavior and how they went to seek treatment. Uh, there were just individual case reports and uh, uh, that was also only in newspapers which really focused on uh, specific reporting on how women treat uh, sought out uh, health care um, during this time but having said that since this was a crowd crisis moment uh, there's one, just one um, tertiary center which is uh, designated center for providing curative services and that was of the, it was super overcrowded during that time. And um, it that also impacted as to where people sought care and there was no data coming out as to where people really sought care. Was it specifically only on that, in that designated hospital or somewhere else also? So things like that does make a difference for policymakers to uh, decide further in to take next steps for the next episode of any outbreaks. Uh, that you see. So when you talk of human resources, everyone was trained, uh, rapid uh, capacity enhancement was done for all relevant stakeholders as well as service providers. But in looking at supplier side, there was no evidence of how the capacity enhancement process affected the care providers, as well as uh, you could not see if there was any differential impact uh, between male of service providers and female service providers also. Can we have the next slide, please? Yes, so uh, in terms of uh, the another component of the health building blocks about information, there was beautiful IEC materials which were developed during this phase. And uh, this was developed um, with technical assistance from collaboration from WHO and UNICEF, as you can see in the slide. And uh, I would say that this uh, was more gender, uh, to some extent, gender sensitive because it is taking consideration uh, figuratively as to uh, suggesting children as well as showing uh, females in the picture and educating people how to uh, respond, what are the signs and symptoms and what to do in, in the event that they fall sick. So uh, overall, the materials they were developed and general awareness campaigns were rampant throughout, not only Kathmandu, but throughout the country. And it was done more for general public, uh, but uh, as I see, there could be more specific messaging here in terms of uh, not leaving anyone behind, like, for example, any targeted groups, let's say the elderly groups, or you could say people living in slum areas where you would expect um, them not to have one access to information, as well as where they would not be able to uh, make choices regarding where to seek care. So things like that would make a difference as to where they went. And uh, there's some surveillance data, which as I showed earlier in the EWARS reporting sheet, I did mention that uh, there was only reports on what cases was seen. So, uh, my some data showed sex disaggregated data, but then it was not reported public in public domain. So we're not aware publicly what was how the data was used, even though it was captured, and whether it was uh, used for evidence making, uh, evidence informed decision making or not. Can we have the next slide, please? So in terms of financing, another building block. Uh, overall, in the Ministry of Health, we do have a gender equality and social inclusion unit, uh, which tries to ensure that within the health system, uh, the gender component is taken forward. And uh, every year within the budgeting, there is gender responsive budgeting done. But uh, specifically during this uh, dengue outbreak, no report really showed how the budget was translated to reach women or any vulnerable groups that were affected during this outbreak. Can we have the next slide, please? And in terms of supplies for medicines and vaccines, rapid diagnostic kits, they were supplied to everyone, but as again here, there was no evidence that if active case seeking was done to ensure that uh, it was reached out, uh, diagnostic services reached out to vulnerable population. 
or it was informed to them uh, to come to the hospitals for diet for to seek services. So these kind of uh, discrepancies were seen during the health system response. Can we have the next slides, please? So to conclude. Uh, this was a crisis moment. As health systems researchers, we do understand that uh, all response has to be blanket. Uh, it has to be a blanket response because you have to cater to the needs of everyone. But when we talk of health systems, uh, we want, can we have the next slide? Next part, yeah. So we, when we talk of health systems, we want health systems to be more uh, responsive, more effective, and most important is it, uh, we want it to be equitable so that um, it would have been better for us if the reports had uh, shown where active case finding and uh, given us information about uh, how aware the vulnerable population was. This affected, from my perspective, the decision making both on the policy. Uh, makers' point of view, decision making from the policy makers, as well as decision making on the uh, individual where to seek care, how to seek care, and that affected. So it affected both the supply side as well as the demand side. And also, um, I think there was more of uh, differential social and economic uh, impact could not really be seen uh, because uh, we didn't really have data about how the treatment outcomes were, especially focusing on the vulnerable group of population. So, um, um, can I have the next slide? Yeah, so, this comes to the end of my presentation. I would like to thank uh, all the organizers for hosting this webinar and for making me a part of this. Uh, over to you, Tim. All right, thank you, Chandani. Um, and our third panelist today is Omide Ogundahunsi, who will be talking about his work with the Access and Delivery Partnership and the importance of gender considerations in implementation research. Over to you, Omide. Thank you very much, Mami, and um, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, Tim, can I have the, the first uh, slide, please, the title slide? So I'll be speaking this uh, afternoon about some of the work that we have done under the Access and Delivery Partnership together with um, colleagues here in TDR and focusing particularly on how um, implementation research can be an entry point, should indeed be an entry point for considering gender dimensions um, when we are addressing the challenges of Um, Tim, can you unmute me? Okay, next slide, please. Um, can we skip that one and go to the next one? So by way of background, the Accident Delivery Partnership um, is uh, funded by the government of, of Japan, but it's a partnership that involves the UNDP, the World Organization, TDR, and, and PATH. And what we are doing is to support countries to strengthen policies, human capacities, uh, systems, and regulations, which are needed to ensure that medicines, vaccines, and diagnostics ultimately reach those people that need them. And uh, you will agree with me that, that by their very nature, <clears throat> uh, NTDs are very susceptible to um, resulting in certain vulnerable populations being, uh, being left behind. And so uh, we think this is a very important consideration within the context um, of this project. Next slide, please. So we try to address this uh, through what we have um, described as the value chain of access and delivery. And um, you will see that we are going from the period when the technology becomes available, it could be a diagnostic, it could be uh, thing, uh, right on to when it gets to um, the, uh, the, the, the patient. So we're going through the process of regulatory approval, how the countries will select and prioritize, through the process of uh, the supply chain, public procurement, distribution and storage, 
and when it gets to the end users and the healthcare workers and the patients themselves. And there are various um, uh, critical points there where we are able to provide some support and intervention as a partnership um, in the regulatory the control system through technology assessment, supply chain management, um, also issues around enabling policy and regulatory framework um, for vigilance and safety um, when it comes to, to the patient, and also material research um, to enhance optimum distribution, optimizing the supply chain, optimizing the delivery of the service, and optimizing the utility of the uh, intervention by, by the patients. Next slide, please. So, essentially, what we are looking at when we talk about implementation research is addressing this gap which you see here illustrated in this cartoon, where um, the product has gone through the research and development pipeline. And you have a product, but then there's a question of how you get it to the population and how you get it to them um, in the most effective and efficient manner. So, we see that it's not enough. For the intervention to be to be to have efficacy to be proven to work, it also needs to work in real life context among the population that, that need them. So, implementation research will be addressing the issues and barriers and challenges which programs identify in the course of trying to deliver an intervention. And very often, in, in virtually all cases, this can be very context specific, um, depending on, on the economy. Um, uh, situation, depending on the culture, uh, depending on the power dynamics in the, in the, in the community, uh, depending on the stakeholders that are engaged. Uh, so the ultimate aim is to improve the delivery of this intervention and also to improve program intervention and effectiveness. Next slide, please. So we see that um, intervention research would highlight conducting research in real life setting. It will pay attention to the context and also be mindful of the needs um, of, of the audience, um, which is being, um, which has been supported through, through the research. And uh, this kind of research is, should be done in and with the communities because of the contextual factors I spoke about a short while ago, the gender dynamics, which uh, I will touch on subsequently. Uh, this, all these uh, factors influence implementation and effectiveness of, over time. And IR, uh, as we call it for short, um, can address and explore um, various factors uh, around, around these issues, around poverty, geographical remoteness, traditional beliefs, gender dynamics, and in the process influence the, um, the effectiveness of the uh, in, intervention and also um, help us to understand and address better health inequities. Um, next slide, please. So, when we talk about uh, gender, uh, sex, and other social stratifiers, these, um, these uh, factors they intersect to, to very dynamic relationship and they intersect and um, have um, relevance and of course matter a lot in regional research. So while I will not go into um, details in terms of defining uh, sex and gender, suffice to say that uh, sex refers to the biological or, 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 or um, chromosomal attributes that separates male, female, and intersex people, uh, while gender is much more defined by socially constructed roles around behavior, activities, um, attributes, and opportunities in the society, which it considers appropriate for men and women, boys and girls, or people who have uh, a non-binary identity. Next slide, please. So we see, um, as Sally mentioned, our first presentation. Well, very often when we collect data in research, it's not all the time that we um, disaggregate the data by either sex or age. But then it's very important to give the serious consideration because when we disaggregate um, data um, by sex, for example, 
they can trigger a deeper reflection and uh, further uh, research on effective action that can be taken. If you look at the slide that uh, we have up now, um, in the first panel, we see uh, a, a bar chart of uh, new HIV infections in sub-Saharan Africa by age and by sex. And you will see that within a certain, within a certain, age, within a certain age groups, they are more or less um, um, equal. But when you look at the 15 to 24 year age bracket, there's a huge difference between what you see in, in males and in females. So when you have data disaggregated in this manner, it helps to prompt further reflection. You want to ask the question, why do we see this big changes in, in, uh, in, in the number of new infections amongst the males compared to, uh, among the females compared to, 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 to the males and why in this age group. So this is, is very, is very, is very um, relevant when we are um, collecting data and research and in IR in particular. Next slide, please. We also we talked about um, the, the um, intersections between sex, gender, and other social stratifiers. Uh, during the last presentation, when Chandani was speaking, she had mentioned some of this. And we see that this, uh, this gender, sex, and the interaction with other social certifiers and environmental determinants shape how people are vulnerable to and how they experience infectious diseases, uh, how they experience STDs, as well as their ability to get access to uh, health care and, and treatment to address the challenges of, of, of these uh, diseases. There's going to be a bit more about this um, in the um, in, in the uh, TDR toolkits, which we're looking at in, in incorporating intersectoral gender analysis into research on um, infectious disease poverty, which will become available um, later in the year. Next slide, please. So, why does it matter to understand gender and and the, and the intersection. Well, for us, um, when we're looking at um, improving access and delivery of interventions, when we're looking at um, inclusive and responsive um, programs, entity programs, for example, uh, this is very important because it helps the programs to understand if they need to operate differently within and across sexes, age, and gender identities, um, factoring in things like ethnicity, geographical locations on that different circumstances and, and, uh, and context. Um, it also helps us to do research which would um, inform strategies to avoid ignoring gender-related dynamics that can influence how effectively a strategy will work in real life. Uh, next slide, please. So I will just very briefly Touch about um, uh, an experience which um, we, uh, we which we which we had with um, the uh, um, program uh, um, recently. So while I say that IR is research to help us identify and overcome bottlenecks um, against effective access and delivery of new health technologies in the context in which we are working um, within the ADP, and this research is addressing real life conditions um, with gender dynamics in context. When we fail to consider sex and gender, we may end up neglecting an important determinant of knowledge use. Uh, we may end up completely reducing the effectiveness of uh, intervention. And we might also inadvertently reinforce gender stereotypes, uh, which um, can just happen without you realizing that that's what is, is, really, is really going on. We don't spend time to really reflect on, on uh, and do a proper analysis of, of the situation. Again, we can promote and uh, or increase gender and, and health inequities and in access to health care and health outcomes. And the example I was talking about, about the girls, we, it was when we um, began to look at uh, disaggregated data of, of those incidents, we found out that there was a higher incidence of case detection like amongst boys compared with girls. And that prompted the need to now ask the question, were we seeing more, were we seeing less of girls because 
of the stigma associated with this uh, with skin um, lesions which accompany yours, um, or because the really was a lower incident amongst amongst them. Um, Amongst the girls, and these are the kind of questions we we'll ask when we um, apply a gender lens to um, the work that uh, you're doing within implementation research. Next slide, please. So, when we talk about um, so getting um, the data and um, within the context of IR, um, being uh, being um, more aware of the influence and impact of gender on, 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 on the programs. I think one of the ways we can start is by disaggregating the kind of data we collect um, by sex and by age, and then go beyond uh, to do uh, a more, a more, more in-depth um, uh, gender um, analysis of the work that, that we are doing or intend to do. Because sex and gender, to a large extent, very much as we've had some of the earlier speakers talk about influence health and disease, influence access, influence response, um, influence um, um, even health seeking, health seeking um, behavior. So the data that you collect with the projects and when you are making your plans uh, can be looked at in terms of the, what, what, what you've collected, looked at in terms of who will benefit from, from the project. Are you unwittingly um, reinforcing a stereotype where by a certain gender uh, gets more attention um, than the other on account of the dynamics within that context, within that society, um, or you know, you, you 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 can look at these these two these two aspects uh, depending on what kind of project you are doing and uh, what issue you are addressing within the context of your research. Next slide, please. So we want to talk about um, an intersectoral gender lens in this, in this context. Um, we are looking at um, issues that will support equity analysis, um, things that will deepen our understanding by better you know, reflecting on complex program realities which are around issues related to gender. It helps us again to address uh, inequity by identifying vulnerable um, members of the population who may otherwise have been missed. And then also, it also helps us to identify the structural drive drivers of inequity. And when we identify these drivers, it's one step closer to being able to also addressing uh, these inequities uh, within the context of the society and, and the health um, system. Next slide, please. So we, within the Access and Delivery um, Partnership, are working with um, countries and with institutions to uh, try and be more gender transformative in terms of um, Facilitate, facilitating and uh, building capacity for effective access and new, new health technologies. We are doing so by um, working with individuals in key institutions to create greater awareness of gender dimensions of, um, of, of the, within, within, the, within, the, within the programs. And that would um, we expect to lead to gender considerations when projects have been, have been developed. And ultimately, um, beyond that, beyond the project, we would like to see institutionalization of gender analysis along the ADB value chain. Value chain being institutions which are involved around regulation, institutions involved around the supply chain, institutions involved around um, patient, patient care, institutions involved around also some of the information research that we've done uh, to improve the delivery of interventions. And we will ultimately expect that the gender analytical framework um, can be applied to interventions um, across board, and also there will be a uh, much more robust and effective intersectoral gender analysis. So when we talk about intersectoral gender, gender, gender analysis, what we're actually talking about is the process of analyzing how gender power relations 
uh, intersect with other social security fires and how they affect people's lives and how they create differences in the needs and the experiences in the health system and uh, how policies, services, and programs can also help to uh, address these differences and mitigate uh, whatever barriers they would have created. Next slide, please. So when we are uh, working with, with within the, the um, research um, framework for implementation research, uh, there are some questions which we uh, look at um, in the context. Uh, questions such as, I have just about six of them up on, on the screen, but there are a lot more. We're looking at questions of how do this intervention increase or decrease gender inequities within the economic statutes, how it affects um, ethnic groups and also other political contexts. We ask questions about whether the intervention will work differently for some groups like men, women, or people um, who are non-binary. And if it does, why does it do so and how? Um, we also we can also consider how gender relations will influence the outcome of the intervention um, amongst, amongst um, other questions. Next slide, please. So I think finally, it's important to also mention that when we talk about um, within the context of intellectual research, intellectual research by its very nature, it's not a long ranger one man uh, research. It's a research that involves multidisciplinary teams. And we want to also um, have a more robust gender perspective within our research project. It's important that this, the, the construct of the team will include social scientists that have expertise and experience in, in gender research. And they are essential if we want to conduct um, a, a detailed and quality gender analysis. So essentially, it's important to understand that right from the point of when you are conceptualizing the idea to identify um, the relevant members of the team and not have them on as an, as a, as an afterthought or add on when you go and put together um, the, the, the whole idea. And this is what we um, uh, are promoting uh, amongst um, other approaches within, within the uh, PDR and uh, within the Assembly Partnership Project as a whole. Next slide, please. So in, in, in summary, we think it's important uh, that gender and sex should always be considered in general research. Uh, the failure to integrate these aspects within the research would, again, lead to the neglect of an important determinant of knowledge use. It could also reduce the effectiveness of the implementation of the intervention, uh, because then you are not really looking at how it affects the you know, different um, relations and the different uh, gender. We, again, like I said earlier on, uh, would inadvertently be reinforcing gender stereotypes and possibly create or increase gender health uh, and, and health inequities in terms of access to care and, um, and, um, and, and, and health outcomes. Um, so within the, for the final slide, um, I will say, next slide, please. That's, uh, in conclusion, uh, it's important that we reflect on the, the, the work uh, the, the work, the projects, the, the, the program that, that we are engaged in, look at what kind of composition we have in our team members. Do we have the relevant capacity or the, or, or, or the skills for gender analysis? And if we don't, I think it's important that we give the serious consideration and identify and engage um, the persons with the requisite skills uh, so that we can have um, a, a, a much more robust and rounded uh, research project that involves um, looking at gender dimensions also. Thank you. Thank you, Olamide. Um, so we have a little bit of time left for the Q&A session. Um, and I'm wondering, I like to open the floor. Um, if any of participants have a questions, please write down uh, your name and uh, the question to the chat box, please. All 
Okay, I guess I I don't see any questions coming in. So let me ask a question from myself to perhaps to Tandani. So how does a climate, climate change, fragility, and changing context impact NTD risk and the response for women and men? Okay, thanks, Mami. Um, I think climate change is a issue which is upcoming and uh, we are all experiencing it in some form or the other in our daily lives. So in terms of health, uh, climate change, it mostly affects uh, the social and environment, uh, environmental determinants of health, especially clean air, uh, as we all know, safe drinking water, uh, food, and then a secure shelter. Specifically with uh, health and with NTDs, because of climate change, it has attributed mostly to re-emergence and emergence of infectious diseases, especially like malaria, dengue, uh, cholera, and other waterborne diseases like cystosomiasis. And uh, this has been alter, uh, attributed mostly due to altered uh, habitat, loss of biodiversity, also because of uh, human-induced genetic changes in disease vectors and pathogens, which has been uh, these have been shown from studies. And uh, when you talk of vulnerability uh, because of climate change, you talk of uh, vulnerable population. So uh, it's always the same population which is vulnerable. Uh, usually it's the poor who are vulnerable, the people who are less educated. Um, why the people who are less educated? It's because uh, it impacts more on uh, decision making, especially with, in relation to their access to resources, access to information, access to seeking care, things like this affect them. And usually uh, you would see that predominantly women are more disadvantaged and more vulnerable as compared to men. Then also uh, in this era of urbanization where small cities are being rapidly urbanized uh, because of the limited space and crowded conditions, this is another factor which has um, uh, impacted on um, re-emergence of diseases um, of the entities. Uh, uh, also in types of profession, different outdoor activities. For example, let's say for cystosomiasis, a uh, woman would go to fetch water, but because of environmental contamination, because of environmental contamination of water, they would be more exposed, leading to more being more vulnerable. So I think uh, these factors mostly, uh, it's an amalgamation of multiple factors because of climate change, which has caused um, change in uh, vector pattern and disease pattern. Um, which can you explain the um, influence of um, violence? Influence of yes. violence. Yes. yes. So especially in fragile uh, and conflict affected states, uh, the violence against it is again the women who are more vulnerable. So violence against women is rampant and they, it increases their vulnerability, vulnerability to disease, uh, uh, not only to disease uh, exposure, but also, as I said earlier, in terms of uh, making decisions for seeking care, getting information, where to seek care, how to seek care. And they are already compromised, not only physically, but also because of the abuse, the mental state of mind is not good. And all these factors would ultimately, does ultimately affect their access to health and their responses also to treatment because it has to be a very holistic approach to how you treat, uh, especially women who have undergone violence at some point uh, in their lives. Over to you, Mami, if you want to add anything. I 
All right, thank you, Chandani. Uh, we have two more questions. Um, the one from Kim, uh, the Liverpool School of Tropical Medicine. And uh, we also have another question from Edith, Switzerland. So, uh, Kim, would you like to ask a question to the panelists? Yeah, thank you very much. Um, just say thank you to all the panelists. Oh, there I am. Thank you to all the panelists. I really enjoyed that. And uh, being involved in this paper, I can see recommendations four and five coming out strongly around disaggregating data and about working together and the importance of collaboration. My question, Chandani, thank you so much for giving that real life example of a dengue guideline. 2019, just been completed and little mention of gender or disaggregating data. And I think what struck me the most is that you had a gender and inequality and social inclusion unit. And I guess what I want to understand, is this typical across policies related to disease? So for all the panelists, and how do we better connect units like gender and inequality and social inclusion while making policies for gender and NTDs? Okay, shall I have a go? Hello? Hello? Yes, Chandani, go ahead. I was muted. Uh, yes, Chandani, please go ahead. Yeah, so um, we do, like, in terms of um, gender equality and social inclusion, I think among South Asia, Nepal is one of the country which is more proactive in terms of uh, having uh, mainstreaming gender and intersectionality within the uh, health system per se. Uh, starts right from the Ministry of Health. Uh, as I said, there are units situated in Ministry of Health, Department of Health Services, which are the governing bodies. But besides that, they also trickle down to uh, various uh, layers of the health system, right down uh, to the lowest point of the lowest uh, service provision of the health system. Having said that, even though provisions are there, it does not really mean that uh, it is implemented well. And uh, it, uh, I, what I see lacking here is, uh, one, I give credit to the government for tackling dengue, which was unexpected in Kathmandu. But as I mentioned earlier, tackling it, but then if they had uh, collaborated or they had uh, taken guidance from people who were within the Ministry of Health, I think things would have been more equitable and um, more responsive, targeted, or responsive to targeted audiences, uh, where especially in Kathmandu you have pockets of slums where people would be more vulnerable. So targeting these kind of areas and these populations would be helpful. So what I see main lacking is especially communication and integration between units within even the ministry. So sometimes that's a disadvantage. So even though it works in policy and it works on paper. Sometimes implementation arrangements are not put in place appropriately. And in, term, in times like this, uh, people really don't know how to interact with each other and there is a communication gap. So I feel that there was this uh, communication gap which led to things being less equitable, uh, which could have definitely been better. Does that answer you, Kim? Yes, yeah, so thank you very much. I think that's really useful. And I think it's good to have that as an example of a policy. And one of the other questions is related to that. Thank you. Good. Um, so we have a, one more comment from Edith in Switzerland. Uh, this is to all the panelists. Um, any recommendations on how to influence social norm without being rejected by the communities? Do you have any response, Sally, Chandani, or Omide? Sally, please. Okay. 
thank you very much. It's a really important question, and it's great to see the questions coming through. I think, as I said, and as we've all said in the presentation today, gender norms vary through space, through time, and they are amenable to change. But there can be politics around change. And I think what's important within NTD programs is to develop cultures of mutual support, develop new partnerships. And we need to ensure that we are listening and hearing and being informed by the voices and perspectives of people living with NTDs themselves. So working with support groups, responding to their needs and realities. And I think in the case of NTDs, community-based drug distributors, and community health workers, those groups that play a critical interface role in providing treatment, providing MDA or mass administration of medicine, but also teachers, are allies and are strategically positioned and are from the communities they represent. So working with them to better understand how gender roles and how gender norms can make different groups vulnerable and it's going to vary and we're here it's seeing comments coming in this is what happens with lf in indonesia and as chandani has said climate change is bringing change and the ways in which gender vulnerabilities play out are going to vary so we need context specific responses to work on gender norms without backlash and that is about new partnerships partnerships community-based drug distributors partnerships with teachers, partnerships with community health workers, partnerships with all the different people involved. And Olamide had that slide with everyone, all the different players and stakeholders. We need to develop those partnerships. But absolutely critical to that is partnership with people affected by NTDs themselves. And we've had examples in Countdown with work in Nigeria, partnering with community-based drug distributors and others to look at gender inequities and how they play out using participatory action research, implementation research processes to respond to gender barriers. And that has led to increased uptake amongst women for MDA. So that's also linked to what can we do at a policy level to bring change. So I think ultimately partnership, partnership for gender justice. Thank you. Just to add a word to that, um, this Ulumide here from uh, TDL, uh, I think um, also um, the a top-down approach would, of course, more often than not result in, in, in a rejection. But again, like, like Sally had mentioned, engaging the stakeholders and having a mutual respect uh, with the partners would very much enhance um, your uh, effort to, to influence uh, um, societal uh, norms or stereotypes which impact negatively um, on, on access to healthcare and, 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 and the programs along, along this line. So the partnerships, having the right stakeholders and having um, the, the people around the table um, with mutual respect would go a long way to forestalling any chance of rejection. All right. Thank you, Olmide. So I think we are coming to end. Uh, once again, I'd like to thank you all for participating in today's webinar. And let me conclude this webinar by saying that just a few months ago, the UN Secretary General called on all sectors of society to mobilize for a decade of action on three levels. The first one is global action to secure greater leadership more resources and smarter solutions for the Sustainable Development Goals or SDGs. And the second one is the local action, embedding the needed transitions in the policies, budgets, institutions, and the regulatory frameworks of governments, cities, and the local authorities. And the last one is us, the people action including by youth, civil society, the media, the private sector, unions, academia, and other stakeholders to generate unstoppable movement, pushing for the required transformations. So it's time for us to deliver on the SDGs. 
And I hope that the you will join us in making unstoppable movements to uh, tackle NTDs and to do so with the greater understanding of the gender dimensions of NTDs. So we will follow up with you all by email. Uh, Tim, if you could show the last slide to show where people can look for the information, that would be great. So if you joined the webinar last minute, uh, please go to the website that we are going to show you now and let us know that you are here so we can follow up with you too. So for now, uh, thanks to you all for joining the webinar today. Thank you and goodbye.